Yeah, a minute, everyone. My name is Sabrina Hakimi, and I'm a volunteer serving as a member for business services with the Azahan Economic Planning Board for the United States of America. And I am a board member of the American Ismaili Chamber of Commerce. I would like to welcome all of you to this webinar planned by the Agahan Economic Planning Board for the United States. Today's webinar is about the financial impact of the coronavirus, COVID-19, and how it has affected small business cash flow management. Before we introduce our panelists, I would like to invite Agbar Bunawala, who is the chairman of the Agahan Economic Planning Board for the United States, to say a few words. Chairman said. Just one moment while we get um, Chairman Agbar on the line. Yes, Yali uh, everybody, and thank you for joining the webinar. Uh, the second in a series of webinars pertaining to uh, the special COVID situation. Uh, we had the kickoff one, the uh, inaugural one last Sunday, uh, the financial impact of COVID-19 uh, on Sunday the 22nd. And uh, we're pleased to present, uh, as we had discussed last time, the second one uh, pertaining to a topic which is of uh, a lot of interest to a lot of small businesses uh, of how to manage cash flow in such uncertain times. Uh, we know that businesses have been impacted uh, quite dramatically in the current situation in a very short period of time. Uh, many of the receivables have been extended. Uh, businesses is uh, impacted greatly. Uh, and uh, the Jamaati businesses, uh, as with other businesses, are trying to find appropriate strategies to cope with this uh, extraordinary situation. In this time, the governmental subsidies and the programs that have been introduced, including the, the three, three different uh, phases of the subsidy programs, the CARE Act that was introduced yesterday and day before, uh, are all going to be discussed, shared with the Jamaat in this presentation as well as in subsequent ones. So with that, I'd like to point out a couple of things that uh, in terms of the upcoming webinars, we're going to have two types of webinars planned. One will be a thematic type of webinar that cuts across all industries and all verticals. And the other type will be a, an industry specific webinar, which will do a deep dive into individual industry segments. For instance, we could have one on convenience stores and gas stations. We could have one on hospitality, QSR, restaurant, fast food, on real estate, for instance. So there will be these two types of webinars which will be hosted over the next few weeks, either thematic webinars or industry specific webinars. The one common factor amongst all of these will be that we will strive to provide the Jamaat with practical and actionable steps that can be put to use. If, however, there are other suggestions that the Jamaat has, please let us know of the subject matter that you would like for us to cover, and uh, we, would, we will attempt to cover as broadly as possible. In terms of reaching out to, uh, for help and assistance to the Economic Planning Board, the Economic Planning Board has formed a special task force called the Economic Response Team, ERT, the Economic Response Team, to support those Jamaati members who need assistance, especially emanating from this COVID-19 situation. If you need to reach out to the Economic Response Team for any question or information or assistance that you seek, please call the Access Helpline so your inquiry can be routed to the appropriate specialist team. In this, please remember that the access helpline is for everyone 
including Jamaati business owners, professionals, and entrepreneurs, as well as Jamaati members needing help, financial, social, and other assistance. So please feel free to reach out to the access line. That's the only way for you to get access to the specialized economic response team. The access team will convey the query to the ERT member and uh, the economic response team member will be happy to call the Jamaati member back and respond to their query in a very customized manner. Finally, uh, all, the, all the webinars that the EPB and other institutions are hosting are being recorded and are available uh, on a Jamaati portal. Until such time as we get um, a final place for all the economic webinars to be posted in one place, they are currently being housed in the AICC on the AICC website, the American Ismaili Chamber of Commerce, the website address is ismailichamber.org. So if there are Jamaati members who miss this webinar or have missed the previous one or would like to re-listen to any one of them, please feel free to go to the ismailichamber.org and you will be able to access uh, current and past webinars. With that, I'd like to hand it over to, hand it back to Sabrina Hakimi uh, and, and hope you find this program relevant and we would welcome your feedback and advice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman Saad, for sharing your words of hope and for EPB's institutional support for anyone in our Jamaat needing assistance. I will reiterate uh, Chairman Saad's uh, message that a link to a recording of this webinar and the Economic Resource Guide, known, also known as the ERG, uh, will be available um, on the ismailichamber.org website. We are constantly updating it. Um, just now, the U.S. government stimulus package, the CARES Act, was released. We have a summarized version of it as well on the ismailichamber.org site. So please do make use of these resources that are available to you. Now let us begin the next part of our webinar. The format for today's webinar will be 30 minutes of presentation by our experts, followed by 30 minutes of moderated questions and answers. I would encourage all of our listeners to submit their questions via the question toolbox on the bottom right-hand corner of your web browsers. Uh, I do apologize, this function will not be available on Facebook Live, um, but you are more than welcome to submit your questions um, to the ERT team online. With that said, I would now like to introduce our first two panelists. Our first two panelists today will be Mr. Kevin Wynn. He will be spending the first few minutes hearing from Kevin Wynn. He is the Public Information Officer at the SBA and has been with the organization since 2005. He will give our Jamaat today an overview of the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program and how it can help small businesses that have been affected by the COVID-19 coronavirus. Our other panelist today will be Mr. Amir Marani, who has been a CPA in Dallas, Texas for over 25 years. I would like to invite Mr. Marani to talk about cash management solutions and then walk our business owners and service professionals through the application process. He will be telling us on best practices in cash management and how they can be best utilized by small business owners, not only C-store owners, but also jewelry, store owners, beauty salons, QSR, and business owners in the hospitality industry. With that, I'd like to invite Mr. Kevin Wynn to begin his presentation on the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. Thank you, Sabrina, and good afternoon, everyone. The United States Small Business Administration Economic Injury Disaster Loans are just one piece of the expanded focus of the federal government's coordinated response, and the SBA is strongly committed to providing the most effective and customer-focused response possible. SBA offers economic injury disaster loans to small businesses, small agricultural cooperatives, small aquacultural businesses, 
and private nonprofit organizations affected by the loss of revenue due to the coronavirus. Economic injury disaster loans provide the necessary working capital to help small businesses until normal operations resume. They do not replace lost revenue. SBA offers these loans with reasonable terms in order to keep payments affordable. Terms are determined on a case-by-case -case basis based upon each borrower's ability to repay. These loans may be used to pay fixed debts, payroll, accounts payable, and other bills that can't be paid because of the disaster's impact. The first payment on the economic injury disaster loan issued due to the coronavirus will be automatically deferred for one year. Small businesses can also receive counseling assistance throughout the country from SBA's 68 district offices, as well as our resource centers, including small business development centers, women's business centers, SCORE volunteers, which are service core of retired executives, and veterans business outreach centers. Applicants have nine months in which to apply for these economic injury disaster loans. There's no fees, there's no closing costs, there's no prepayment penalty on these economic injury disaster loans. Additionally, SBA disaster loans for previous disasters that are still in repayment are deferred through the year, through the end of the year 2020. Loan amounts in terms up to 30 years are set by SBA and are based on each applicant's financial condition. As you can see, interest rates are 3.75% for businesses and 2.75% for private nonprofits. The economic injury disaster loans are limited to $2 million, less any business interruption insurance and any other recoveries. Apply only online for these SBA economic injury disaster loans. For collateral, currently, we are not taking real estate as collateral. Due to the difficulty of getting liens recorded at city and county offices, we are taking business assets such as furniture and fixtures, machinery and equipment, and inventory. We will utilize a general security interest to perfect this collateral. These documents can be completed at the state level online. Your loan officer can assist you with this step. Small businesses are the heartbeat of our communities. As they deal with this crisis, they continue to do what they can to help their community, and SBA will continue to assist small businesses with the emergency loans and business counseling. I would like to mention that the Ismaili community business owners are fortunate that in addition to the resources and assistance available from the United States government and the Small Business Administration, they can also tap into Ismaili community volunteers for help through the economic response team and through the access helpline that is available to all members of the community. Here's how to apply for the SBA Economic Injury Disaster Loans. You can see on your screen www.sba.gov slash disaster or contact our Customer Service Center at 800-659-2955. If you prefer, you can email Disaster Customer Service at sba.gov. <clears throat> On Friday, March 27, 2020, President Trump signed into law the CARES Act. Included within this law will be the opportunity for small businesses and nonprofits applying for an economic injury disaster loan to receive up to a $10,000 advance for emergency capital. Currently, SBA is updating our system to implement this provision. It is not currently available. In the interim period, 
you can still apply for a full economic injury disaster loan, but will need to reapply for the advance when the system is updated with a streamlined application. Once updated, the advance will be included in your economic injury disaster loan application process. Small businesses and nonprofits can use the economic injury disaster loan advance for payroll or other business operating expenses. The amount of the advance will be based on number of employees and will be capped at $10,000. Our system engineers are working as quickly as possible to make this change on our website. Once again, I encourage everyone to apply for these small business economic injury disaster loans and to do it as quickly as possible. Thank you, Sabrina. So, Kevin, um, I do have a question that's come through. And before our next speaker will, I, I, I know our next speaker will talk us through the specific process of applying for SBA loans. But can you tell us this? Is this support for the Economic Disaster Relief Fund, is, is that available to all kinds of businesses? Or are there any restrictions depending on the type of business activity? For example, are there any differences of support for support offered to retail businesses like convenience stores, gas stations, restaurant and fast food store operators, dry cleaners, right. they, jewelry store owners? Sure. All small businesses can apply, Sabrina, and we encourage all of them to apply. Let the SBA make that decision. We also go by NICES codes to determine the income and the number of employees, which determines what kind of a small business it is, but these are for small businesses only. We encourage all small businesses across the country to apply. Let us make the decision to determine if you're eligible for these economic injury disaster loans. And, and this also includes professional service businesses like doctors' offices, lawyers, CPAs, IT consultants, etc. Yes, it does. Just apply with SBA and your loan officer can assist you in the eligibility of your disaster loan. We encourage everyone to go out to that website and apply. Thank you very much, Kevin. We'll bring up more questions for you um, at the end of our next presentation when we open up the Q&A. Uh, but thank for you, now, Sabrina. I would, thank you, Kevin. Um, I would like to invite now Mr. Amir Morani. Um, before we start your presentation, um, Mr. Morani, um, I do want to reiterate that he's been a CPA in Dallas, Texas for over 25 years, and he'll be starting his presentation by talking about cash management solutions, and we'll be walking our business owners and service professionals through the application process. With that, I will turn it over to Mr. Marani. Thank you, Sabrina. Let us discuss some of the strategies that business owners could use during these very difficult days of business challenges. I want to start with an important message for the Jamaat. As you hear different ideas today, on how to manage your business situation today. If you feel that you need help with any of these ideas and need support, please do not hesitate a bit. Please call Access phone number and you will get EPB support in helping you through this. So here are the different ideas today. Take notes and remember, you can call Access to get the support when needed. EPB is doing its best to support all members of the Jamaat in economic matters so that we can all come out safe and secure at the other end of this crisis. Let us first talk about some operational strategies that you can use right now. Monitor your daily cash flow, both cash inflow and cash outflow very carefully. If you are able to use a spreadsheet like Excel, please use that to develop your daily cash flow worksheet to see how much cash is coming in each day and what are the cash outflow requirements each day. This way, you will know your challenges in cash flow for the next few weeks and months, and it will give you a chance to think and plan your strategies. This is a good time to talk to your lenders, your vendors, and your financial institutions, including credit card companies, to allow you extra time to make your regular payments. There is a general understanding in the economy about the cash crisis, and you will find good help from financial institutions and vendors in rescheduling your payments. If you have SBA loan, then you should be able to get a deferment on those loans if you call the bank. 
the banks will work with you and defer your loan payment as they have the authority to do that for SBA loan. You can also use some financing strategies to support yourself during these times. If you have available line of credit that you could use, you may want to fund them and move the funds into your checking account for the short term so you can use them when needed. This is just a way to keep the liquidity available in case you need it. We will be talking about some other strategies available, but these are some financing possibilities that are available if they are available to you. Keep an eye on them, get, keep them ready. There, is, there are also some provisions that have come up that you can draw on the retirement accounts to use for this purpose, but we have to be careful on how we use our loans and credits so that we, it doesn't become a burden later. We will now move on to some of the government support that has become available. We'll now talk about the major programs that have been announced by the federal government to support business owners. Today, we will talk about the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, which we just heard about from Kevin, SBA Express Bridge Loan Program, and the Paycheck Protection Program. Please note that the CARES Act that was signed into law this week has many other features that will help you create some cash flow for yourselves and you should consult your tax consultant and our EPB team is also working to continuously update the Jamaat on the opportunities. We will now discuss in a little more detail about the economic Disaster Est heard great amount of detail. Jamarani. Jamarani. Um, I see him live. Jamati members, I apologize for, for this. It seems like his um where did I disconnect? Okay. Uh, so we this the interest rate on this loan is three point seven five percent for small businesses, and we uh, we can use this loan for debts, payroll, uh, fixed cost, which are mortgage payments. Uh, loan payments, rent, utilities, all of those things, but not to refinance an existing loan. We will now talk about the details of this process. Can we go on to the next slide? So SBA is looking at the credit history. The credit history is declared uh, in SBA rules that it has to be acceptable to SBA. Repayment ability of the business will also be looked at and the collateral, if available, will be taken. That's the rule on this. So uh, we would think about it that, as, as Mr. Wen just mentioned, real estate is not being taken as a collateral right now. Business assets are being taken as a collateral and that collateral will be looked at as when the loan is approved. The amount of the loan will be determined by SBA. Uh, the SBA will look at your application and it will determine how much the loan will be applied for. So well, a lot of questions come in that how much loan can I apply for? So you don't have a chance on this application to write that I want 100,000 or 200,000 for this loan. You only apply for SBA to consider you for this loan. Uh, once your loan is reviewed by the loan officer, they will determine how much loan you can be approved for. You, you should try to provide complete details as needed and also have other information ready with you if and when the loan officer calls, for, calls you from SBA. The loan term on the or the length of the loan is also to be determined by SBA. So the loan can be for as long as 30 years, but that also they will decide. The repayment does not start until 12 months after the loan is dispersed. Uh, 
I will now go over the documents that you definitely need to be able to apply for these loans. You will need your business tax return for 2018 because you need to attach a copy of that to the application. This is 2018 tax return, not 2019 tax return. You will need personal financial statements for the owners of the business. If you have multiple businesses that you own, then you need the information of those businesses. If you own 20% or more in the other businesses. Most importantly, you should urgently work on preparing your financial statements for the whole of 2019 and up to now. You don't need to submit it, but from that you will need to submit a list of liabilities that you owe on the date of the application. This schedule of liabilities should be submitted to the application. I want to highlight that something about an emergency economic injury grant for $10,000 that we just heard from Mr. Wayne. This $10,000 grant will be granted, will be given within three days if you apply for the EIDL. As Mr. Wayne mentioned, the systems are getting ready because this was put into law uh, just Friday, so they are getting it ready now. In order to apply for this loan, you have to go to the SBA disaster loan website that we just heard, heard about from Mr. Uh, Wen, and you can apply it there directly. If you have your documents ready in PDF format, you can upload them there and submit, submit it online. This is a direct application process and you can do it directly. You don't have to go to a bank for this loan. This is a page of instructions that you can see on screen. Um, there is a two page form that you have to fill out, form five of SBA. And so you fill out that form, attach the documentations and upload it right there on the website. This loan may take a few weeks for approval, so try to apply it as soon as possible. But please, please understand that there is a grant of 10,000 that you could ask for instantly and that system will be available. So you could ask for it if you are applying for EDI, EIDL. We suggest that you should consult with your CPA or accountant for your business to help you prepare the documents for this application. If you run into any challenges with getting help from your accountant or if you have a problem filling out applications, please call Access and our local EPB team will connect with you and refer you to some Ismaili professionals all over the country who are available to help with this application process. Let me talk about the express bridge loan that has SB has authorized banks to issue. This loan can be up to a maximum of $25,000. The interest rate that can be charged on this is a little high, but it is possible that banks will understanding the current situation will not be very unreasonable in their interest rate. It is a slightly expensive loan due to SBA fees and also banks own credit requirements, but again, no collateral is required and it requires an existing relationship with the client. So you have to go to your own bank for this, ask them about the express bridge loan, and maybe they can help you with a $25,000 loan quickly. This is the SBA loan. We'll now talk about a very interesting program that has been introduced by the CARES Act on Friday, the Paycheck Protection Program. This is a brand new program that was also passed into law on Friday. Any business with less than 500 employees can get this loan very fast from their own bank. You can go to your bank if you are a sole proprietor, independent contractor, self-employed individual, and you can get this loan very fast. Now I say fast, but that would be after it comes into effect at the bank level. The law was passed on Friday, the government is saying that by next week, the banks will know how to give this loan. So please stay in touch with your bank and you will be able to take advantage of this in a timely manner. Let's talk about some of the details about this protection, payroll protection program uh, loan. Under this program, you can get 2.5 times of your monthly average payroll as a loan from the bank. So for example, if your monthly payroll in 2019 was $20,000 per month, which is on the next screen that you will see coming up, then you can get 
a loan of $50,000. That is two and a half times or two and a half, two, 250% of your payroll expense for a month. So if your payroll for a month is $10,000, uh, you'll get $25,000. And that's what you will get instantly. Once this program goes into place next week, this may be a good one for the business owners to consider and apply. If you apply for this loan and get it, you are not disqualified. And I want to stress again that you're not disqualified for applying and getting the SBA Economic Injury Disaster Loan. However, there will be an adjust and adjustment to make sure that you don't get the same expenses covered by both loans. So if you get money for April 2020 and May 2020 payroll from Paycheck Protection Program, then you could get the EIDL loan for, for payroll for June and July if SBA approves it. So they will not duplicate, but they will consider you for both loans. Paycheck Protection Program is a good program to consider because a part, this program allows for the loan to be forgiven if you use that loan amount for genuine and acceptable business expenses, including payroll, rent, utilities, mortgage interest, etc. Your loan can be forgiven 100% afterwards. This certification of forgiving of the loan will happen subsequently. So you don't have to worry about how do you certify that today. Right now, you need to apply, apply for it and get it if you can get it fast from the banks. We hope that the system will be in place next week so we can do that. Let's do a quick comparison between the EIDL and the Paycheck Protection Program. So as you see, the EIDL is, the amount will be determined by SBA once they review your application. In the Paycheck Protection Program, however, the amount is fixed. It is 2.5 times your payroll. Now, uh, if the question comes that, how do I get that information to the bank? Of course, this is a brand new thing, but based on what we have been told from the official channels, from the uh, interpretation of the bill that was put in place, the, the underwriting process has been very, very simplified. It has been simplified to the lowest possible level for them. So it is a self-certification. So uh, in, the way they have presented to us is that it is a self-attestation that what is the monthly payroll that, that you're giving and based on that they're giving it. Of course, we as business people should be prepared with it. So if you have your payroll records, if you have your monthly payroll records, keep them ready, just in case the bank says, no, we want to see your payroll, uh, payroll register for the last three months, take it. But remember one important thing, if your business was not in existence in 2019, they will take the average for January and February 2020 to come up with the average payroll for you to get the payroll protection, paycheck protection program loan. The timeline on this is expected to be fast compared to EIDL. Uh, the repayment of the EIDL is over up to 30 years, but the paycheck protection program is, is to be forgiven if you are, to, you are able to give the evidence to SBA subsequently through the bank that you use the money for the genuine business purposes that are allowed. The application is for EIDL is direct for Paycheck Protection Program. It is through your bank. So, and again, remember, if you apply for Paycheck Protection Program, you get the money there. It doesn't mean you will not get EIDL. They will make an adjustment for what you've already got and there will be an adjustment amount given to you. Finally, Let's go on to the last part of this, where we will talk about the state program. Not every state, but some of the states have come up with their own programs. For example, the state of Florida, the state of Massachusetts, they have their own loan programs also. So please look at, keep, a, uh, keep an eye on your state programs and see if there are programs available. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, ask for loan payment deferrals from the bank on SBA loans 
Also, if you have any pending tax matters with IRS, including collections, please talk to IRS and they will suspend the collection activity at this time. Also remember that you have overpaid in 2019 for your taxes. And if you haven't filed your 2019 tax return, then don't wait for the extended deadline. Please file your return so you can get the refund fast. Finally, we would like to assure the Jamaat that EPB has put extraordinary human and knowledge resources to help and support the Jamaat in these difficult times. If you run into any challenges, you can reach out to the institutions through the Access Helpline. EPB team will reach out to you and guide you through this. National EPB has also activated a national economic response team to help Jamaat in matters where there is advanced level expert support needed, including specialists from specific industries such as restaurant, hotel, cosmetology, etc. Thank you, Sabrina. Thank you, Mr. Mirani, for your in-depth uh, uh, example on how to apply for the program and for showing examples on, on how to manage cash flow support. Um, before we launch into the Q&A, I'd like to thank both you and uh, Mr. Wynn today for your insights and your information. I truly believe uh, and can see that this is uh, going to be a benefit to our Jamaat. I see all the questions coming through and everyone is very responsive. So thank you very much today for, to both of you um, for, for your help and your insight. Um, I will kick off our question and answer session today with a question for uh, Kevin. Um, Kevin, um, a, an important question that's come to my uh, attention is, um, what can the SBA economic injury disaster loan be used for? For example, can they be used to refinance loans or mortgages uh, in the case of, say, hotel owners whose occupancy levels have dropped, like they still have bank payments and operating expenses to pay? No, they can't be used to re refinance any existing debt. They can be used to pay fixed debts, payroll, accounts payable, and any other bills that can't be paid because of the disaster's impact. They also can't be used to expand businesses. Okay. And, and how long does it take to process and approve loans typically? Generally, what we're saying on our website, it takes two to three weeks. And that's why we encourage business owners to get into the SBA and apply as quickly as possible. All 50 states in the United States territories have been declared a disaster area. Therefore, hundreds of thousands of small businesses are now applying for economic injury disaster loans. We're ramping up with customer service agents and loan officers so the quicker folks can apply, the quicker they can get into the queue and a loan officer can get in touch with them. Thank you very much for that. Um, Mr. Morani, um, the next question is directed towards you. Um, as you know, we have many different types of business owners in the audience. And in your opinion, as a CPA, is there a rule of thumb on how should businesses think about their cash position during this time? For example, how many months of expenses, what kind of expenses should everyone plan to have on reserve for when applying for an SBA or other loans? So um, a lot of small businesses run into cash crisis very fast because of the cash collections uh, may slow down or uh, the re receipts may not be coming in. So as we said in the beginning, look at all your available line of credit facilities. Um, our own credit unions are offering some support and then rush for these uh, support loans that are available as, I, as we just heard that you could in fact get uh, some of the funding right away against the Paycheck Protection Program, hopefully in the next week, and you could get a $10,000 grant on the EIDL fast, and then try to control your cash outflow by trying to negotiate all the um, fixed payments that you have to make, where, whether it is a loan payment or whether it is a rent payment, which we will be hearing in the second part of this webinar on how to try to negotiate a slowdown on cash outflow so that it doesn't affect you. Of course, some of the preparations of three to six month reserves are may not be possible today, 
but you have to look at it, all the available resources that we talked about today that are there. And, and are all businesses eligible for the Paycheck Protection uh, Loan Program, even if they have an SBA loan, an existing mm -hmm. SBA loan? In fact, yes, uh, they are all eligible. And I, I wanted to especially uh, stress that uh, this is very interesting situation that all of our listeners, Jin Kabi, Koi Bikasam Ke Apke Pasme, Agar Koi Uber Chalata Hai, Ya Koi Independent Contractor Hai, Koi Bikasam Ke Independent Consulting Ka Kam Kate Hai. This program, Iskan Dame Nune Bola Hai, Ke Self Employed People, independent contractors, independent uh, consultants bhi iske andar apply kar sakte hain paycheck protection program mein. So, kabhi kabhi humko worry hota hai ki humare paas mein paycheck nahi hai ya hum ye nahi kar sakte hain. So, we would like the Jamaat to look at it ki ye iske andar mein special provision hai ki even self-employed people who are filing schedule C on their tax return, jinke paas koi W2 dikhane ke liye nahi hota hai, wo log bhi iske andar apply kar sakte hain. And iske liye, please, if you are not able to get help on that, call access. We will try to provide the help on it so that you can get advantage, get, take advantage of this opportunity. Wonderful. Uh, thank you for that. Um, Kevin, another question. Uh, this is directed towards you, Mr. Wynn. Um, if I have an existing SBA disaster loan from a previous disaster, what options do I have as a business that, owner? Yeah, that particular small business administration disaster loan from any kind of previous disaster is deferred automatically through December of 2020. The um, Borrow does not need to do anything. SBA is automatically deferring the payments of all previous um, disaster loans. And, and how does the business define an impact and or a loss? Is there a formula that would help businesses understand how to apply and qualify for approval? Yes. What we do is we look at a financial per historical financial perspective of the last year. And they'll find that by filling out the schedule of liabilities. Since we're not requesting tax returns, if they fill out the schedule of liabilities on the website, that's how SBA will determine the economic injury of the business. And working with the small, bus small business applicant arrive at a figure for the economic injury disaster loan, but it's based on a historical perspective of the last year. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Morani, um, the next question is a further clarification um, on the Pay Paycheck Protection uh, Program loan. If I'm self-employed with a small staff as a professional services provider, for example, a, an IT consultant or a doctor, would I be eligible to count my own salary uh, for the Paycheck Protection Program? Yes, and that's what the understanding is from the law that has been passed, that has come out. Um, it clearly lists all of those independent contractors and consultants, self-employed people. So I would like request, mail salon owners. Yes, and uh, and people. Like yeah, it. if you own a mail salon, nail salon, if you have a cosmetology business or any kind of businesses that you're running. Even as a self-employed person, because a lot of times we log schedule C file karte hain, 1099 se file karte hain. Iske andar mein inhone mention kiya hai ke you can qualify for it. Now, ek cheez yaad rakhein ke ye law Friday ko sign hua hai. And I'm sorry, Sabrina, I'm going to uh, address in both languages. So, you know, no uh, uh, ye sign hua hai Friday ko. Bank ke pas me abhi shayad information complete aai nahi hogi. Do not get completely disappointed right away if you hear kenini asa, we don't know about it. Please stay on top of it, stay in touch, talk to EPB because based on what the law right now says, everybody is qualified. And we don't want anyone to miss out on this opportunity to support themselves in these difficult times with this support being provided by the Paycheck Protection Program. The clarification to the banking system may take a few days, but let's stay put on it and let's continue following up. Stay in touch with them.
institutions, we will try to help out if needed wherever. Um, Kevin, um, what are some of the typical reasons for the SBA to reject or disqualify loans? And what can be done to maximize their chances of approval? Um, generally, that would be if they're defaulted on a federal loan, if they have child support that's passed due. Those are just a couple of the reasons. And SBA, what we will do is we'll issue a decline letter and let, notify the small business applicant of that. And they will have six months in which to remedy that situation and then come back to SBA and reapply for the economic injury disaster loan. The quicker they can remedy the situation which caused the decline, the quicker we can get their application back into the system, process it, and approve them for an economic injury disaster loan. But those are a couple of the reasons. And another one is if they don't have the repayment ability or their credit worthiness is not satisfactory to SBA. But we're, we're a direct lender of the federal government. Therefore, our underwriting criteria is much more lenient because we recognize that these small businesses are victims of a disaster that was not of their making. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I do want to announce that we are getting a lot of questions. Uh, we will try to have them uh, and answer them in categories uh, online. However, we will continue to post more information on the AICC website. Um, we're also able to guide and assist our Jamati members by the Access Helpline. Um, the Access Helpline will be posted again on this webinar so you can write the number down. Um, but I will state that the phone number is one 552 That's again one 552 uh, That is the Access Helpline. Um, while we do have um, a, a few more minutes left, I will ask a few more questions that are coming through. Um, are any independent contractors included on the payroll? Uh, will this assistance be available to those independent contractors, um, Mr. Morani? Can you repeat the question, Sabrina? Okay, so if there's any independent contractors on payroll, will they be protected? under the payment protection program yeah so this is interesting like so if you think about it uh, let's say on your payroll you have independent contractors who are not on your payroll so when you go to the bank and you say i want two and a half times of my pay monthly payroll these people these individual independent contractors will not be counted towards the payroll because if you heard it earlier, as I mentioned, they themselves are qualified to go as independent contractors to the bank to get a paycheck protection program loan. So it would become duplicate because if you were to get the money from the bank to pay them, and they can also get it themselves from the bank, so it would become a duplicate. So I think, you know, this is the clarification that uh, we heard about it from the law explanations that came about is that because independent contractors themselves are qualified to go to the bank to get the loan for paycheck protection you would not be include able to include them you would only include the people who are on payroll with you wonderful thank you um uh, kevin i have a question for you how does the eidl work if you are eligible for the ten thousand dollar grant um, how does that SBA view that portfolio with EIDL? They're just implementing the uh, parameters of that into our system. All I know is that they can use it for um, payroll and other business operating expenses. Once, once it's up and running, people can just go to the SBA website and find out the, the, the other parameters of the program, Sabrina. This information that was presented to me just came out this morning. Um, for the guidance of the uh, $10,000 program that um, was just the advance. So I'm not as mm -hmm. familiar with it, but they can go to their web to the website. Keep an eye on the website and keep looking for the advanced program. Okay. Sabrina, I wanted to add a little uh, clarification to the payroll cost. Sure. Okay, so Please. I mentioned that uh, whatever is your payroll for uh, an average payroll for the month, you'll get uh, two and a half times for it. 
uh, please check the details because this payroll cost is not only the gross pay, but also includes the benefits that you may be giving to that employee. So health insurance or other expense, other benefits that you are paying for that employee uh, in addition to the gross payroll is also included, including, you know, if you the payroll tax that you'll be paying, the bonuses, everything is included in there um, as a total payroll cost uh, for uh, for the employee. And, and Mr. Mulani, is, is there any um, maximum limit uh, that, that there is there a cap on how much you can apply for uh, under the payment protection program, payroll protection program? So one of the things that is mentioned in there is that uh, they are capping the payroll, the annual salary to 100,000. Um, so if somebody makes more than 100,000, uh, you will not be able to take the average, they include their salary above the 100,000. So the cap is 100,000 per year of the employee salary. And as long as you put it all together in there, there is no cap amount um, as long as you know, you're falling into that uh, uh, category there. And now, now this question could be directed to, to both Kevin and, and to, to Mr. Marani. Um, what is the difference between a grant and a loan in this case? Does the $10,000 grant not have to be returned or um, does it incur any interest or it doesn't incur any interest? I'll, I'll let Mr. Marani field that one. Yeah, it is a grant um, that is to immediately support the business owner. But if you get this grant, um, based on the explanations provided, it would be adjusted when the forgiving of the Paycheck Protection Program happens. So if you borrowed 100,000 on the Paycheck Protection Program, and you are qualified for a forgiving of, uh, of all of that, um, based on the explanation given, if you got a $10,000 grant, then that's gonna count towards it. So you will end up having a $10,000 loan because you know out of the 100,000, they're only gonna forgive 90,000 and the remaining 10,000 will remain as a loan. So if, if you get the Paycheck Protection Program loan, and you got the grant, there'll be an adjustment of the forgiving part of that loan. Yeah, and let me let me add to that as well, Sabrina. And um, the the ten thousand dollar advance will be needed to re, to to be repaid. That will be part of the economic injury um, disaster loan, but it will have to be repaid on the economic injury disaster side. The ten thousand dollar advance. Um, I have one question here that says, though, what if I don't have any other source of capital um, before uh, the loan gets approved? Uh, will they make us liquidate our 401k or brokerage account or liquidate our cash value for life insurance um, before we're approved for a loan? Yeah, so there is a provision in the CARES act which allows people to borrow or withdraw from their iras or uh, company funded retirement plans and uh, we will talk about it in a separate session but you could take money out of it uh, there will be no penalty on it if you withdraw money from it this year the 10 percent penalty has been waived for any money taken out and then you will be paying tax on it the income tax will still be due um, so that would be, uh, you know, paid over a three-year period based on what we have been, we have learned so far from the law. So you would have a loan on it, but it will be payable over a three-year period. You, I'm sorry, you'll have tax on it, but it will be payable over a three-year period. Okay. And uh, Mr. Marani, you spoke about additional resources being available at the state level. Would you happen to have additional information or point out to our listeners where they can find inf additional information for state level support available for businesses, uh, say in Texas or Georgia, Florida, or New York? 
Yeah, so I gave a couple of examples when I was talking about it, but fortunately, uh, our national EPB uh, team has put together a, a guide on it uh, that is available, which I think you will also be giving the link of it, or you mentioned already, that economic resource guide has all the lots of information across state. I guess, you know, it is on the screen now. Um, you can take a look at it. Uh, our team is updating it on a very regular basis. So you can take a look at it and see what, what different resources are available for the Jamaat to take advantage of across the country. Uh, and Mr. Mani, we've had a few questions come in um, about uh, businesses in Canada as well. So I have one question here that says, my partners and I have a business S Corp registered in the USA. Two of the partners are in Canada and one is in the USA. Do we qualify for the loan and what's the return loan policy? Uh, if you are asking about the EIDL, we would have to talk to, uh, you know, we, we'll I think this is something that you would have to uh, look at in detail of what percentage of ownership is there, but uh, I, I wouldn't want to spend too much time on foreign ownership at this time, but definitely mm -hmm. if you call Access, we can help out on that. Sure. And uh, under the CARES Act loan, how many months of payroll will it cover? Uh, the Paycheck Protection Program, as I mentioned, is two and a half times of um, payroll, but then EIDL may cover more, and I think there is a provision in EIDL, and Mr. Wayne can confirm that once you are approved for EIDL for a certain amount, and if you need more support, you can actually go back to SBA and uh, request for more support uh, if you are not able to survive through the time because of, you know, situation not uh, resolving it yet. Mr. That's, that's true, Mr. Amir. Yeah, that's true, Mr. Amir. It's a live loan for about a couple of years, so you can always come back and ask for a loan modification should you need additional uh, disbursements. And also, if you don't need as much money as SBA has approved you for, you can actually have that money requested to be returned. You're also under no obligation to accept the loan once you're approved. Um, so. I do believe we have reached our, our limit for today. I know there's a whole lot of questions. Um, we will be addressing them at a later time and or you can call in uh, to the access to a helpline and a Jamaati member will assist you for that. Um, I do want to let everyone know that this call is being recorded. Links of this recording and additional resources will be available for use on the AICC website as well as will be emailed out to all registered participants within 24 to 48 hours after today's call. Um, I do also want to thank um, Kevin and Amir Murani today for all of their insight, all of their information. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your expertise. Um, it was, it, it, it proved to be very valuable to our Jamaat today, as you can see from the line of questioning. Um, at this time, uh, we will be taking a short pause uh, to allow any other uh, registered participants to come on the line who are also wanting to participate in our part two of, of today's session uh, where we'll be discussing rent abatement strategies. So we will be taking a short break and coming back in about a minute or so. We just want to give them enough time uh, to get on the line. So thank you very much, and we'll see you back in about a minute. Thank you, Sabrina. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Mr. Rani. All right, um, for anyone who is just joining us, I would like to welcome all of you to the part two of the Small Business Cash Flow Management Strategies webinar planned by the Agahan Economic Planning Board for the United States of America. In the first half of our webinar, we learned about the Economic Disaster Relief Program from Kevin Wynn at the SBA, the Small Businesses Administration for the USA. 
And then we had a CPA, Amir Morani, share his insights on cash flow management strategies for small businesses. He also walked us through the SBA loan process program from a business owner's perspective. In this second segment of our webinar today, we'll be covering on how to help the Jamaat fully understand what legal options are available to tenants or renters, as well as land or asset owners, and talk about what process and paperwork would be required to go through the negotiation. And also understand how the negotiations between tenants and landlords would play out on the ground and how the process and discussion may be different in different industries. I would like to everyone to note that this call is being recorded and a link to the recording and additional resources will be available for your use um, after this call, uh, within 48 hours after this call today. The format of this segment of the webinar will be 15 minutes of brief presentation by both of our experts, followed by 15 minutes of question and answers. I would encourage all of our listeners to submit their questions via the question toolbox on the bottom right-hand corner of your web browser. As stated before, please note that we may not have the time to be able to answer all of the questions that are posted. If you have a question that has not been answered or you need assistance, please feel free to reach out to us through the Access Helpline. At this time, I would now like to introduce our two panelists. Our panelists for, for this segment of the webinar are Mr. David Joffer. He is a partner at Joffer Law and has been counseling and, and assisting business owners for over 20 years. David's commitment to the convenience store industry and our trade associations brings exceptional business and legal acumen to the business litigation arena. Our second panelist for today is Mr. Amin Aladina. He is the founder and president of Crown Global Investments, a national leader in the travel and hospitality industry. And Amin has transformed Crown Global Investments into a nationally recognized and respected firm. He is the seasoned entrepreneur with a background in real estate, telecommunications, manufacturing, and hospitality sectors. At this time, I'd like to invite David to walk the Jamaat through what legal options they can implement to assist the Jamaat in deferring rent and negotiating more economical options to aid them during this economic crisis. Okay, uh, Yali Badad, everyone. Uh, my goal for this presentation is to uh, introduce you to a four step process that we've developed to help. Um, negotiate your uh, existing lease. The four, step is the four steps are going to create a framework. And within that framework, we'll look at some strategies uh, that are designed to help you build credibility and gain leverage with your landlord when you ask for a rent concession. And towards the end of the presentation, I've got a couple of cases that I, I can share with you. And we'll talk about the do's and the don'ts uh, when you embark on to this uh, process of renegotiating your lease. Um, most of you know, all of you know, that uh, lease is a document that governs the relationship between a landlord and a tenant. Since we are talking about, you know, landlord, tenant, and leases, understand, uh, I'm not here giving you a specific legal advice about your situation. We are having just a general discussion about the framework and, and the strategy. So, um, but that relate going back to the the uh, content the relationship that you have with your landlord governed by your lease is changing and it's changing not because of what's in the lease but it's changing because due to the external forces that we're all experiencing covid-19 governmental regulation about shutdown of certain businesses non-essential businesses so all of that is is impacting that relationship and how, um, to what extent does these relationships, um, how long they last and how bad they get, uh, certainly depends on what happens to our uh, economy as we go forward. So uh, let's look at, you know, what is this, this four-step process? 
the idea is first thing you want to do is to identify who is involved in this transaction. Sometimes it's really simple. It's just you and the landlord. And landlord owns the property, gas station, whatever business you have outright, and there's nobody else to check. Just the two parties can come up with a new agreement and, um, you know, and, and just uh, put that to writing. But oftentimes you may have landlord tenant, but there may be a landlord. You may have a loan against your business. Your landlord may have a mortgage against the property that you occupy. So uh, if you know whether the property is mortgaged or not, you want to make sure that you understand. So whatever solutions you come up with so that there is a uh, consent. Uh, your your um, mortgage uh, may call for landlord to negotiate with them before they do anything to the lease. Uh, and then not so uncommon in our community, we might have a four-party transaction where you certainly have the landlord, the tenant, but uh, and the lender, but you may also have a subtenant. Sometimes uh, some people in our community will lease a space, but will let somebody else to manage or somebody else to become an operator. So if if you have that type of situation, then you want to make sure that uh, that person is on the same page, meaning your sub lessor is on the same page as you are when you are identifying uh, the, the, uh, the uh, strategies to move forward. Moving on to the next step of our um, four-step process is review the governing document. So once you know the party's relationship and what you're looking for is, look, your typical lease could be anywhere from eight to 11 pages on a on a very small retail parcel to over 55 pages if you are within a large shopping center or in a mall. So the idea is you know, to get you to focus in on relevant provisions. So if you have that lease in the PDF format, put in these, find the words, unforeseen, impossible, impracticable circumstances, uh, force majeure or act of God. The reason you're searching for these words is to find the provision that may describe what your compliance to that lease is when we are dealing with these uh, extreme circumstances. So once you understand um, what ability you have to negotiate and what leverage you have, uh, I think you'll be um, better prepared. Also understand that, for example, if, if the lease has certain provision, whatever they may be, they could be further modified by your uh, federal, state, and, and local legislation. So if you have a retail business that's non-essential and you know the lease says you gotta stay open for eight to 10 hours a day and then the government says you shut it down, well, guess what? The law just overwrote your lease. So understand that you, are, you, know, that you have those um, outside parameters that you are aware of it as you are um, reading your lease. Finally, uh, we may have uh, guidance from our institution. Obviously, what you're hearing today, you've got council involved, you have EPB leadership involved, you've got NADA leadership involved, and all our um, smiley associations are involved in making really this thing happen, including from Sabrina, who's really driving the Zoom call to everybody else that has uh, participate, uh, participated so far. So be on the alert. You may have some uh, impact coming from that type of leadership. So if you are dealing with uh, smiley landlord, smiley tenant, you may have um, uh, additional consideration. By no means am I saying today that you start calling the leadership and, and start complaining that my landlord smiley and he won't cooperate. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is just be attuned uh, to, to, to our, our own guidance that may have some impact on what kind of uh, uh, leverage you finally achieve. So that's uh, number one uh, uh, was the one to, uh, to identify the parties. Number two, review the document. Number three is you want to communicate. Uh, don't ignore this problem. The, the COVID-19 did not kill your obligation to make a uh, lease payment. They are due just as they were before COVID-19. So yeah, COVID-19 kills a lot of things, including people, but it does not kill your obligation. So uh, the best approach, would be if you haven't done it already, um, get in touch with your landlord. The, the right way to do it is your access helpline and all the resources that are available. They have that ERT teams that has certain form letters that you can use. And there are several different versions of it. 
So depending on your situation, when you call them, they will give you the document that you write your name and your landlord's name, and then you can modify it to fit your need and send it out. I mean, this is why they do what they do um, uh, to help you. So um, get that letter out if you haven't done it. And it's important to look at the tone. Uh, and I've been involved in representing both the landlord and tenant. And, you know, making a demand of the landlord for an abatement is probably uh, not a good idea. You want to take a softer approach. Everybody knows that we're involved in this crisis. Uh, and I think your landlord, uh, you know, if you've got a longstanding relationship, is going to want to do something to help you because now there are recourses available to the landlord uh, from the bank. So just take the right approach, get the letter out. Once you send the letter in the mail, pick up the phone, whether you send them a text or email or however you've communicated with your landlord in the past, just to let them know that you put some uh, letter in the mail that to give you a call once they get it or you will follow up in a week or so. It's the uncommon courtesy. I think, um, you know, uh, if you want the best outcome, then, then, then treat it uh, like you really need their assistance. This isn't the time uh, for gamesmanship or try to get one up on the landlord or see what you can get uh, just because everybody's under dire circumstances. The idea is to ask for reasonable accommodation. And this third step is setting that up for um, communication. Final step, uh, step number four, is now you say, okay, what should I ask for? Well, typically the negotiation uh, classes and the instructor will tell you when you're dealing with another party, ask for something that's easy to get before you ask for something that's harder. So you may, uh, if you see your lease as you're reviewing it, yeah, sure enough, it says I need to, you know, the business needs to open for that many hours. But the governmental regulation says non-essential business shut down. So when you ultimately have the conversation on the phone after your letter, this is what you're going to say. By the way, Mr. Landlord, I see the provision says I have to remain open. Can we suspend that given the emergency because I legally can't open my business? What's, what's the landlord going to say? He's going to say, of course, it's not costing him anything. And there's no choice that he or she has. Um, second, uh, do your homework. Find out what is it that you want to ask your landlord for. Asking for six months lease abatement uh, without any forethought is probably is not going to get you very far. And certainly, if the landlord says, sure, I'll consider your request, send me your financial. So if you don't plan ahead or have these four steps, you may realize that your credibility and le leverage that you were trying to build may just dissipate by you asking for things that are unreasonable. So you know, look at your own um, financial, be ready to send it out. And in fact, plan as if soon as the landlord gets a letter, you get on the phone, you can come up with some kind of an agreement and landlord says, okay, please send me the document so I can review it. All right, moving on. So now we've done the four steps. And within that four step, what should you ask for? What are some of the strategies? What are some of the options? You can certainly ask the landlord to enter into a short-term abatement agreement that abates your um, uh, partial rent. And it, some leases will have it that per year what you pay, some have it as an attachment. So as you're looking at that, that lease and that rental uh, uh, amount due, and you're looking at your cash flow, think about what you can ask for. Is six months reasonable? Is three months reasonable? Are you a restaurant? If you're a restaurant and you're shut down and you have no uh, drive-through or takeout, you're, you're down to zero. But if you're a convenience store, your landlord knows that you may not be shut down. So you have some income, you just don't have what you used to have. So maybe six months under that set of circumstances uh, may not work. Maybe you want to ask for half rental payment. Right. So and when I give you the couple of cases and the example, you'll see how this all fits in. Um, the other thing you can ask for is, uh, you know, tell the landlord that, look, if you give me a concession now, um, you know, we can make that up. So if you have a three year lease, it could become a three and a half year lease or, you know, uh, 39 month lease where you would allow the landlord to recuperate in some way, either by higher rent, uh, or by a percentage of, of, of some kind of profits or sale or however you want to do it uh, down the line. So your landlord doesn't feel like there's no recourse for him. Uh, he or she just has to cut the rent. So 
don't close that opportunity about the ability to do some kind of payback. Under the current situation, you know, there's no magic formula. It, you know a different, the need of a business who's totally shut down is different than a need of a business that has, has basically limited number of hours. Those things are different. So you're going to have to gauge your own situation and, and ask for the um, concession that you're asking for. Let's move to um, the next slide. Well, what if you deal with a landlord says, I'm sorry, I like to help you, but you know, I have my own banks and, and I've got my own mortgage. I'm sorry, you need to really uh, you know, um, pay, your, pay your rent. Um, again, you've set it up with the letter. You're, now you're on the phone and this is what you just heard from your landlord. You may wanna say, hey, Mr. Landlord, have you considered calling your bank? Uh, some of the people in my industry uh, they, they have called their bank and, and, and many banks are willing to offer interest-free option to their uh, borrower. They, some are offering deferred payment. Um, you know, is that something you can do to help me under these, uh, si this situation? If you've got a good standing relationship with your landlord, think of your landlord as a Santa Claus, all right? He's got a nice and naughty list. And if you've been nice, he's going to look for ways to help you. And this is just you saying, hey, you may have other resource. Please take a look while I do my best. And if you've been naughty, uh, then the last thing you want to do is to blow your credibility by asking for things that are unreasonable. So you want to become nice uh, so that you have the best chance. All right, let's go to the next slide. Um, all right, what if none of these things work for you? In fact, you have a property manager. And I've, I've heard from some of my other colleagues that some property managers are taking a very hard line. And the conversation is going to go something like this. You call a property manager for some kind of an abatement and they will tell you, hey, I have an 85 year old. That's the only thing he has is this rental income. You convenience store are still open. If you don't pay any rent, how is she going to buy groceries? So, I mean, you're going to get uh, somebody and who's going to push real hard and say, I'm going to start my eviction paperwork if you don't pay. And, you know, I know I can't evict you now, but come 60 days, we're filing that paperwork. If the conversation goes in that direction and you have no ability to get in touch with your landlord, then what you may want to do is um, say, hey, have you looked at the uh, force majeure provision in the lease? Remember, we talked about that earlier. Uh, they are typically in standard lease. And if you find it, uh, then it may have the ability to, um, to uh, give you some relief from compliance. So, you know, you might, if they're sensible people, they might just kind of realize that they need to work with you. Uh, or if you threaten them that you're going to have your lawyer look at that lease to help you come up with uh, some kind of an agreement. Let's move to the, um, to the next slide. Uh, additional resource, you know, don't forget, you may have a commercial insurance. Uh, there may be some loss of income. That's a tough one uh, under these circumstances, but do take a look at it. You know, take that policy out as well. And also inform your landlord to look at uh, their policy and see if there's any type of business interruption coverage that could help either the landlord or you. And even if it helps the landlord in return, um, it could help you um, get some uh, recourse. All right, what's the next slide? So two uh, real quick situation, one in uh, Atlanta, I uh, helped a convenience store uh, who uh, negotiated a three month rent concession from the landlord. We sent a very soft cordial letter. Uh, landlord said, fine, I'll give you three months, but if things, so it was supposed to be for April, May and June. And the landlord said, at least on the phone, that if things change in May, then I do expect you to pay the June's uh, rent that's due in June. Uh, and so then I asked, well, what if things don't improve? And what if uh, things go even worse? Um, can we have a separate negotiation uh, about? And he said, well, you know, time will tell, but at least those doors weren't closed. So don't ask for everything up front. That's one of the things you don't do. Ask for what you need, ask for what you can support, and then you'll go a long way. Finally, I've got one uh, landlord in San Diego that just um, received a letter where uh, the tenant, the bar, is asking for a three-month 
uh, rent because the bar is shut down. And, um, you know, we looked at the San Diego ordinance and they have uh, no eviction for both residential and commercial. And in that letter, the tenant said, oh, we have a, a renewal coming up. We would also like you to extend the renewal. Give us the 90 day break, extend the renewal. And there was one vacant space. And they said, we would like to take that space as well. All that in one letter. So our response to this is uh, to this person uh, is going to be, we're considering your space. We're considering your request for uh, renewal of your lease. We're considering your request for getting the additional space. In the meantime, send us your financial. Uh, we may be willing to forgive the rent for May, for April and May. Not saying anything about June. And then um, the second option is if you don't provide any financials, then we are willing to cut the rent in half. And so just know that you know, you want to get your documents ready so you don't get uh, caught off guard. Just like a landlord would have a strategy, you want to have your own strategy. Just just uh, prepare a good case. Uh, I think that is uh, probably it. What's, uh, what do I got? Resources. Resources, you have access. You know, uh, there are lawyers uh, that have letters that they have created for you, and they can help um, at least give you the templates that you can use uh, for example, this letter starts by saying, uh, you know, I'm writing to provide notice. So you're putting your landlord at no on notice, you know, it's going to be followed up by a phone call, which is going to be followed up by negotiation, which may be followed up by requests for documents that you should be ready to provide. Once that's all done, you can probably do some sort of an agreement, a short term agreement to help you get by. So I think, um, and, and don't forget uh, about uh, the resources that are available to you, use them. Uh, my biggest advice to you is, you know, don't look for opportunities to, to stick it to your landlord. Look for something that is thoughtful. It's going to go a long way. So uh, I know that uh, I have a very limited time, so I will turn uh, the control back to Sabrina. Thank you, David, uh, for your insight. Um, at this, we are running a little short on time. Uh, so I do want to uh, inform our listeners today that we are going to extend the webinar for an additional um, seven to 10 minutes at the end, uh, just so we can make sure that we do get enough of the questions answered. Um, at this time, I'd like to invite I Amin mean, Aladina to offer his expertise on rent abatement and department strategies from a real estate perspective. Mr. Alinita? Hello? Mr. Uh, and uh, for David, uh, David, you you spoke about options available for tenants and how they can negotiate rent uh, concessions with their landlords. Uh, can we look at the other way for a minute? Um, if I'm a landlord and I just received a letter from my tenant asking for concessions and telling me they won't be able to rent, what can I do? Uh, Amin is back. I could take the question now, or I can wait till uh, Amin is done, yeah. and we'll take the questions well, at the well, end. Well, let's 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 address it, and we'll we'll get uh, Mr. Olivier on in a minute. Okay. So, um, what are the other? So, uh, say it again. What's the other strategy? If um, if I am a landlord and I just receive a letter from my tenant asking right. for concessions or telling me they won't right. be able to rent pay rent, what can I do? So, uh, look at look at the uh, letter. Is it coming from landlord? Is it coming from landlord's attorney? Right? Because you you may have a different uh, strategies to deal with. Pick up the phone. You can send a letter, but the reason you may got the letter, you may have the letter is because you didn't send one. They just send it to you. Um, so you may want to pick up the phone and, and just pretend that you had sent the letter and go from step three, which is communication. We're under difficult times. You know, my business is X and my business is either completely shut down or it's partially shut down or I have a dog grooming business, pet grooming business, and I can't get no, I can't get any employees and I'm shut down. So what can we do to, to mitigate the rent? 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, and then go into the insurance. So see whether they, they have insurance that can help and whether they have talked to their lenders. So the strategy is the same. 
Uh, the outcome depends on each factual situation, whether you, you know, just what we just talked about, whether uh, does your landlord have to answer to anybody or is that something your landlord just gets to make a decision? So uh, just gear it up. I mean, if you can't, if you don't have the cash flow to support it, there's no way you're going to uh, be able to do it. And, and by the way, let them know that, you know, there, there are programs that are available that are just being rolled out by the government and then you are actively looking, show that you're dealing in good faith that you're a reasonable tenant. And if you've got a good relationship, I think they will want to do what they can to help you. So that's my response. Thank you very much, uh, uh, David. Now that we have Amin Alibin on the line, I'd like to invite him uh, to give us his perspective um, on real estate. So sorry about that. I apologize. And David, thank you for uh, fielding that question while I was trying to uh, unmute myself. So uh, thank you for having me, uh, and I'll try to be really brief. Um, our company is both, uh, they are tenants and landlords in retail and non-retail spaces. So my perspective is based on strategies that we are deploying as tenants, uh, knowing in the back of the mind what the landlord is or could be thinking. What I'm going to share is um, what our company strategies are, are based on consultation with our attorneys. I suggest planning your strategies based on your business situation. And for those business owners who have multiple landlords, they might have to tweak their strategies accordingly. Um, just uh, adding a, a few more things to what uh, David mentioned in his four-step pr uh, process, I think that is very, very, very uh, comprehensive. Um, I think the number one question is probably what's around to most of our, um, our, our tenants right now is April 1st is around the corner. You have already communicated uh, with the landlord for either a rent abatement, either full or partial and now you're waiting to hear back. So the question on your mind is, what do I do next? Do I send a check or do I not send a check? So our attorneys, again, I'm advising, our attorneys have advised us on multiple different strategies based on each location and lease agreement. Um, once we have communicated with our landlords, our company will either make partial rent payments, which will always go a long way, or for locations that were hammered severely or closed during the pandemic, we will be seeking 100% relief. Um, we are staying put and um, re-communicating back to the landlord uh, to, um, to you know, have uh, the question addressed. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, your strategy with your landlord for each location will be different. Uh, landlords are human just like us. Um, they understand and see what is happening around us. So they are also probably waiting to see how things may improve, speaking to their own lenders, looking at their own options, including cash flows, and formulating their own game plan, just like we are doing. Um, our biggest strategy right now is, and our number one focus right now is cash flow, and how do we preserve cash to the extent possible. So while you might be in a wait phase to hear from your landlord, um, David mentioned um, um, a lot of different things about getting your lease in place, financials in place. I would, I would add something to in terms of, you know, um, kind of take a, go a little broader and look at your overall business landscape uh, and how has it changed um, over the years. Um, were you open during COVID-19 pandemic and did you have to pay more for your employees to come to work? Did you have to hire more for safety and security? Do a full and thorough uh, business uh, evaluation because you um, this might go longer than a few months. Um, so just to want to make sure that you know you have your supporting documents in place to um, to position your response. Another point uh, is you need to look and see how rental payment is done. Do you mail a check or send payments electronically or does the landlord do an automatic ACH? Um, if they do an automatic ACH, you may want to consult your attorney before taking any actions. Um, but um, I, I think um, very important over here is have patience, calmness, honest communication with the landlord and documentation of what has been agreed upon. So let's say that if you discuss something over the phone, I would follow that up with a uh, email confirmation and ask for acknowledgement of the agreement. And like David mentioned, do not use this as a position to, uh, to get a leg up. 
uh, this is um, this is critical time for us, and um, so uh, you know govern yourself accordingly. And last is if you need further assistance or help, EPB has formed a special task force called Economic Response Team (ERT). To those Jamaat members who need assistance, um, you can call Access Helpline so that they can be routed to the appropriate team. I'll turn it over back to Sabrina. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Alivina, uh, for your perspective from the Lander Asset Owner's Perspective. Um, I do have a few questions that are directed towards you, and um, we will be going a few minutes over uh, to, to address those, because I do feel that they are important for the Jamaat. Um, so from an, uh, of an, a landlord's point of view, an asset owner's point of view, uh, let's say you own a few residential properties, whether it's an apartment complex or a shopping strip um, or a nail salon or a restaurant. Um, what do they do if, if you receive phone calls from your tenants, from your renters saying that they have lost their job and cannot pay rent? As a landlord, um, what are my realistic options? Sure. So I'll, um, I'll, I'll answer my perspective as a, uh, as a commercial owner, and then I'll let uh, mm -hmm. David answer from a legal perspective. Mm -hmm. So sure. um, um, we don't do residential homes, so I'll, I'll speak more on commercial side. As of this point right now, we have not asserted a, a base re baseline rent relief policy. So what that means is that we are, um, we are accommodating phone calls as and when they are coming and we are, we are mindful and uh, we don't want to cause any additional stress on the tenants or their families or their employees. Um, we ourselves are exploring what options we have available from our lenders and I think that, um, that itself will kind of dictate how, what and how course of action that we take um, going forward. But at least from, from our and our partner's perspective, we want to be very mindful of the pandemic, and we want to. We know that there is stress uh, that uh, um, our tenants, like I said, are are also um, facing at this point in time, and we want to be extremely mindful and reasonable to our tenants. I'll turn it over to David to answer the legal piece of it. Uh, I think David may not. Uh, he may be muted, or he may not be. Uh, available. Um, okay. Before we get back to him, um, I do have another question for you uh, where it says, can I make sure that my rent release arrangements don't affect my lease agreement or any of its terms? I think it's a, it's a great question and um, I'm a firm believer of consulting with our attorneys uh, in every mm -hmm. documentation that we sign. So my, uh, my recommendation is always that once you have come to a certain agreement, I would have that uh, addendum or, uh, or amendment, whatever that is, to have it uh, reviewed by our attorney and have them uh, look over just to make sure that there has been no material change to any of the provisions of our lease. Um, uh, what should uh, I do? Oh, okay. Sorry. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. David? Uh, yeah, no, go ahead. Okay. I what should I do if I'm on a month to month lease? I want to stay on and I don't want to be kicked out. Would my, this is from the tenant's perspective, would my landlord react negatively to, to my asking for rent relief? So Sabrina, this is a very sensitive matter that needs to be handled mm -hmm. with utmost caution. I would consult uh, my advisor and attorney before moving forward with any strategy. There could be multiple outcomes, so I would recommend caution in your approach if you are intending on keeping the lease. And I, I believe that's what the question said. Uh, mm -hmm. But, and, and could very well be the case that this could be an opportunity that if the intention is to stay in that lease, is to convert the month-to-month -month lease into a long-term uh, lease arrangement. Okay. But and very sensitive. This, tie, that, this ties into that. You know, if, if you're a small nail salon owner or a restaurant and cannot pay rent, once I send a letter to my landlord asking for rent relief, what do you recommend the next step be? So we said once you send the letter, pick up the phone and call the landlord. Um, and that would be that whether you email the letter, however you got it, the idea is to 
to express to the landlord that you are having financial difficulties, you are doing the best you can, and your landlord may or may not know whether you stay open the whole time or you open partial time or you completely shut down. They may have an idea. Um, so, you know, so you do want to communicate that and, and be able to, to show of what you're asking for. So, um, you know, and, and your past conduct is, is, is also going to shape what you're asking for, but whatever you ask for, just make sure it, that you just, that you're ready to send any additional information that landlord is going to ask. Most likely they will ask you uh, for additional information to just support your case. All right, wonderful. Thank you for that. Um, we are reaching kind of towards the end of our time limit. Um, I do apologize to our listeners if we have not been able to field all of the questions we've had and overload of questions that have gone through. Um, but um, at this time, I would like to ask David and uh, Mr. Alivina, to both kind of give us your last minute thoughts and any advice to our Jamaat that you feel would be great to, to leave them with today. I'll turn it over to uh, Chairman to start. David, you're too kind as always. Um, so um, <laughs> there was a great article today in Wall Street Journal uh, that uh, this is make it or break it week for America. Um, I think what we have to realize as a Jamaat uh, as um, and every facet of our Jamaat, that we are in this pandemic together. Um, we all are facing the same challenge. So patience, calmness, communication with whoever the entities are, landlords, tenants, whoever that may be, uh, I think is, is a calling of the time and make rational choices versus irrational decisions. And then I think... Uh, the, the best aspect of our community is that, you know, we always have institutional support. Uh, uh, economic response team is, is there to assist us in every way or form. Uh, and um, I would call Access and um, ask them to connect to our team members. So uh, once again, thank you for having me. And, and uh, everything that Chairman just said, um, the only thing I would add is that, remember, just keep context and perspective in mind. During one of our last calls, what I did is I looked at all the uh, pandemics back from 1800 up until the last pandemic age, and you look at where they originated their pandemic. So they went across the world. How many people died? Now, by that, I don't mean to minimize or mitigate what is happening, but if you put the broader context, the broader perspective, this is absolutely uh, something we can weather and, and, and come out of. It's, it's painful. It will take a little bit of time, but just keep that broader perspective in mind. And I think with, uh, inshallah, with all the guidance that we have and the resources we have, and I work with different communities. And, and so, you know, when somebody calls me at home at 10 o'clock and saying, hey, Mr. Jaffer, I'm calling from Access. Do you have two weeks worth of grocery? I do. Do you have two weeks worth of supplies? Do you have medication you need? I don't know of any other community that does that. So I am so proud to be in Smiley in a time like this. Keep that, you're not alone. There are plenty of shoulders, there are plenty of hands that are going to, to help you. Just do the right thing, make sure you're acting ethically and, and we're gonna get beyond this. That's what I have. Well, David and Amin, thank you very much for your time today, for your insight and your expertise. Uh, it is truly appreciated. Um, at this time, I would like to um, invite and encourage our participants to reach out to the institutions with additional questions or for assistance. Uh, please do contact the Access Help Desk at 1-844-552-2237. The Jamaat should know that all Jamaati assets, institutions, have come together to assist the Jamaat in various ways. For example, the three community credit unions with our Jamaat have quickly come together to develop a COVID-19 assistance program. Our trade associations are helping with procurement of essential supplies in case there are shortages. And our Jamaati members in specific areas of expertise are fully engaged to guide the Jamaat in need of assistance in specific industries. EPB has also pulled together a lot of resources 
and information in the form of the Economic Resource Guide. And this guide will be updated constantly so that the Jamaat and volunteers have access to the latest information on what federal, state, local, and corporate financial relief resources are available for businesses and individuals. This guide and various other reference documents will be available for the Jamaat and a link will be shared with everyone registered for this call within the next 24 to 48 hours. EPV is also developing additional webinars with in-depth insights and tools for the benefit of the Jamaat. So please stay tuned for future webinar announcements. Our institutions also have trained volunteers available to assist the Jamaat. So please reach out as needed via the Access Helpline. Once again, the number is 1-844-552-2237. The Economic Resource Guide is also available uh, for you to, to look at on the AICC website, which is ismailichamber.org. And finally, we will be sending you a link to our short survey on today's webinar. I would encourage all participants to kindly complete the survey as it helps us to develop and deliver on relevant content for you. Thank you and Yali with it.